Hi! So happy that you clicked on the video. Thank you so very much for being here. Are you ready for this? <laughs> because, uh, yeah, today I want to talk about mounted orchids, address some details about their care, and that will lead me to explain why I have some ugly looking mounts. Not because the orchid is ugly, but because of the care requirements of those orchids in my climate and other reasons. I have the pretty versions of classic mounts, which enhances the orchid growing on it. And then I have the examples of my inorganic mounts, which are not at all aesthetically pleasing, but the orchids are growing really well, and they are the ones that make that kind of a mount look good. So let me put it out there, right out of the gate. I am a fan of growing orchids in the landscape. That is how I started growing orchids. Seeing as we had a couple of videos addressing Coco Choir, in Kenya I used to use the hard shell with choir still in it to attach my divisions to the trees in my garden and let the orchids get on with it, allowing nature to do its thing. Not once did I take anything regarding salts in the coconut outer shell and the choir into consideration. I even collected what was lying around the beach and held onto it for the next division I would hopefully get from some family that had their orchids growing large enough to cut pieces off for me. Not once did it occur to me that they needed treating, flushing or anything like that. And not once did I see an orchid struggle. On the contrary, they settled in and eventually took off and grew. But I was not looking for signs of struggle. I was oblivious to that. I saw what I saw in friends' gardens and wanted to do the same where I lived. However, here's the difference. I had mother nature on my side and in Kenya we had daily torrential rain for a stint during the two rainy seasons per year. Thinking back, that is why I got away with using Coco Choir in its raw form loaded with salts. <laughs> Mother Nature did the work and the only culprits for destruction were the monkeys who occasionally absconded with pseudobulbs or chewed on the leaves. This tangent was important for me because living in a climate where orchids can be mounted on anything and everything and left to their vices without much interference or repotting maintenance is the best environment ever. However, for many of us, that is not reality. So we try to mimic presentation and material to make our orchids grow mounted. And then given the right circumstances in a controlled environment, we can recreate some of the feeling of growing an orchid as naturally as possible, even within a contained environment. But the struggle gets real really fast when it comes to keeping up with the vigor or size of a mounted orchid. When it comes time to water and fertilize, supplement and flush, not so much in a controlled grow space, but when growing outdoors, when temperatures permit, and indoors when temperatures are not ideal for a mounted orchid, this struggle gets real, as is the case in my climate. Add to that a climate that is super dry, where the average humidity for the year is around 30%, it really proves challenging to support a mounted orchid. Maybe not in the initial stages, because the orchids we acquire are usually small to begin with, and then we hope to grow them to size, but long term, as the orchid grows to size, the care increases, Watering increases and so does everything else, including the overall weight of the mount. Any epiphytic orchid can be mounted on pretty much anything as long as the material does not burn the roots, which can happen when we over fertilize and the humidity does not match the fertilizer concentration, resulting the drying out of the mount to happen far too fast before the roots have had time to absorb all that we provided. And as long as the material that we mounted the orchid on does not degrade too fast because the reason for mounting an orchid is not always and exclusively about aesthetics, but the longevity of leaving an orchid to grow undisturbed for years and years. So of course we have to be mindful of the material we choose for the orchids we are going to mount. The damage to a root system of an orchid that has been mounted on something that ends up degrading too fast is exponential. The risk of setback or stalling is super high. So it is advisable to choose wood, rocks or bricks even that pose no danger of either burning the roots or in the case of wood degrades too fast. Taking the options of what wood is best and is rot resistant, hardwood is the way to go. 
And here are a few examples. Ideally, you want to be using oak, hickory, pecan, manzanita, cedar, redwood, locust, lilac, citrus gorse, and even Douglas fir bark. If you opt for cork bark, however, make sure that it is baked cork because the material that comes straight off the tree and is dried naturally, although great, it is extremely porous and will degrade faster than anticipated. Baked cork bark is also important because it sterilizes the material throughout, resulting in a critter-free material because who wants to mount their orchids on a piece of bark that has pests in it, which could immediately do a number on the orchid? I have my Dendrobium community mount on such a piece of baked cork bark. And not only is it holding up the weight of the aphyllum, but it has stood the test of time for the past five years with no signs of showing any degrading anywhere. Thank goodness. <laughs> I will leave everything else up to your imagination to think of uh, th yeah, that piece degrading too fast. <laughs> The woods that I would identify that are not ideal to use as mounts are pine and fir, even though I just mentioned Douglas fir, but include basically any wood that has resin or aromatic sap in it. Then other not so recommended woods are willow and birch because they are too smooth. The roots love to grab onto all kinds of irregular surfaces that gnarled wood provides. The smooth wood would work, but it may take a little time for an orchid to actually attach itself. Also, as mentioned, anything along the lines of rocks, lava rock, granite, large river rocks, bricks, terracotta tiles, broken pieces of clay, etc., etc., also serve as perfect mounts as these materials will not break down anytime soon. And while we would think that terracotta or clay appears smooth, they are very porous materials which are great for the velamen to flatten out on and get a hold of the mount. Based on the types of woods and materials I just mentioned, please feel free to add to the list of more great wood examples for mounts as well as your experience with wood you have used but it turned out to degrade far too quickly. I would appreciate that and probably anyone looking for further information in the comments will as well. So thank you in advance for adding to the conversation. While we're at it, if you have found that this video has given you something to think about already, I would appreciate it if you could do me a solid and hit that like button. Sharing it to anyone and everyone that you know who could be interested is also very much appreciated. I find myself being shadow banned by YouTube based on my location and I can use all the help I can get. Thank you for that as well as your support in advance very, very much. Right, as I mentioned earlier on, all epiphytic orchids can grow mounted if the needs can be met. But there are some orchids that do grow better in pots. However, some that absolutely thrive mounted are cattleyas. For beginners, brassavolas are great, seeing as brassavolas are also somewhat drought tolerant. They require less maintenance than other types of orchids. This gives a beginner some grace in the care while learning the ropes of cultivating orchids on a mount. Other types of orchids that do well on a mount, no matter the material of choice, would be vandas and grecoids, tolumnias and phalaenopsis. Like I said, the possibilities are endless if everything can be provided for and the size of the orchid can also accommodate the space <laughs> long term. Also know that orchids grown on mounts in a home environment need to have a higher tolerance of drought than if you were to cultivate your orchids in a greenhouse where the humidity can be regulated to accommodate the periods in between watering. But regardless of which orchid type you decide to mount and where you grow your orchids, even the best way ever al fresco all year round, make sure that it is healthy Otherwise, it might not survive the initial transition from a container to the mount. Bringing me to the point of changing the setup from a container to a mount. Yes, that is a transition. Usually, the word transition seems to always refer to going from organic to inorganic media for potted orchids. But any setup change needs to be treated as a transition. And taking a potted orchid out of a pot and mounting it is a transition and it is quite a radical one. 
So, as with any repot, be it no setup change or changing the media from organic to inorganic, etc., moving an orchid from a pot to a mount is best done when the orchid is showing signs of active root growth or if you are familiar with the growth habit of your orchid just before the new roots start to grow. This way, there will be no shock to the orchid and it will easily continue to grow on the mount without any issues. Without any issues would also mean that securing an orchid to a mount is paramount. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> but yeah, it is really important that the orchid is secured well to the mount and there are several ways to do that. But first of all, before you get to that stage, soak your orchid roots in water before beginning to secure your orchid to the mount. This helps prevent damage as you attach the orchid. If you can add some CalMag and seaweed into that water, then even better because you are giving supplements that will support the strength of the orchid as it acclimates to its new setup. Then, lightly wrap the orchid roots in sphagnum moss. The moss will fall off over time, but it helps your orchid adjust from being in a container to being mounted. The moss will hold on to a little extra water for the orchid each time you water it in the beginning. Using strips of pantyhose, string, fishing line or wire, attach the base of the orchid to your mount. Wrap the material tightly enough that the root system stays in place, but be careful not to be too ambitious as to how tight your orchid is secured to the mount because it is possible to accidentally cut the roots. The pantyhose or other material can be removed once your orchid roots begin to grasp the mount on their own, securing the orchid to the mount. To avoid any serious damage from happening while you secure your orchid, placing a thin layer of sphagnum moss will also protect the roots from the material you choose to secure your orchid to the mount with. Personally, I find that pantyhose is a very forgiving material because its elasticity is an advantage without crushing the roots as it stretches and tightens over the sphagnum moss layer. In addition to that, it holds the sphagnum moss in place and can be removed at a later stage or left to become one with the microclimate that the mount will create until it is either not visible anymore or even degrades and falls off without doing any major damage to the roots that have grown in and around it. As with any transition or repot, immediately after mounting an orchid, place it in a spot that gets bright, indirect light. As the orchid adapts to its new growing environment and begins to show stable growth, you can move it to an area that gets more light. Different orchid types require different amounts of lights, of course, so you'll need to take that into account when deciding where to place your orchid. Do not add to the stress of the transition by exposing it to the conditions it could handle while growing well in the pot or even if it is fresh out of the box and you are mounting your orchid straight away. The same care needs to be taken into consideration, but on top of that, the acclimating phase as well, because now it has to not only grow in a different setup, but also acclimate. However, now that you have your orchid mounted, the major factor of your care kicks in because a mounted orchid typically needs more watering than a potted orchid. The needs for watering will vary depending on environmental conditions like light, heat, air circulation and humidity, but most mounted orchids will need to be watered almost daily or at least three to five times a week. Your humidity levels will be the key factor as to how often you will be needing to water your orchids. Orchids that are grown indoors but not in a greenhouse per se can survive a few days without water, but this can stress the plant and should not be done often. There are several ways of watering an orchid. If your tap water is no higher than 100 parts per million, then it is wonderful to be able to take your mount to the sink and run it under the water for a few minutes. However, if your tap water is not within a safe range, as in soft, then you will have to take the water that you use for your potted orchids and spray them down or soak them in the tub until the mount is well hydrated. Careful with any new growth getting too wet though, unless you have the temperatures and airflow to ensure that they will dry out within a reasonable amount of time so as not to risk any rot. These forms of watering can also be applied when it comes to fertilizing and supplementing, so let's talk about that. And if I only reference fertilizer, know that I am including supplements as well because the how and how much also applies to supplements. 
Fertilizing mounted orchids is a delicate balance and taking the humidity in your environment into consideration is very important because you can get away with higher fertilizer concentration in a high humidity environment which you cannot get away with if growing in dry conditions. Applying a diluted fertilizer every week to start off with will let you observe how quickly the mount dries out and if there's any salt residue forming. It won't take long for salt residue to show, so corrections can be made very quickly by only flushing the mount for the next watering. Any signs of salt formation will let you know that you need to reduce your fertilizer concentration or, if you don't want to do that, after fertilizing, wait for 30 minutes and follow up with a flush watering on the same day, not allowing the mount to dry out before doing so. However, the good news is, Seeing as mounted orchids need more frequent watering, there is actually no need to take the risk of going too heavy-handed on the fertilizer concentration because during the growing season, the orchid will be taking up nutrients relatively quickly, meaning that you may be repeating the application two times per week, hence doubling the amount of fertilizer because of the frequency that you are applying it while still keeping the concentration at a safe range that avoids salt buildup. Everything I mentioned about the fertilizing quantity and possible salt buildup and how to avoid it is based on me assuming that the pH levels of the solution is at a level for optimal nutrient absorption. If the pH is off, then the orchid cannot take up the nutrients, which can also result in salt buildup. Seeing as mounts have sphagnum moss on them for the most part, I would recommend pHing the solutions with the range of 7 being the highest and 6.5 being the lowest, but not lower. The reason being, mounts dry out quicker, so the nutrients that are being applied need to hit the roots at the optimal pH instantly. It is not the same as in a pot where the roots have more time to absorb the nutrients. Meanwhile, the pH range mentioned is ideal for pots as well, but for other reasons. So, if all your environmental conditions are on point and your fertilizer levels are conservative, but you are still getting salt build up, then monitor your pH levels and see if there is something not quite right happening there. And when I reference high humidity, I mean 75% and higher consistently. That is where the humidity will help the higher fertilizer concentration to actually penetrate the roots without the mount drying out too quickly. When I have a day of 85% humidity, which happens maybe once or twice a year, I go gung-ho with my fertilizer concentration because it takes hours for the roots to dry out. At any other given time, I am no higher than 300 parts per million for the bigger vendaceous orchids and definitely not higher than 100 parts per million for the smaller ones, like my tolumnias. Because while in a basket, they are actually set up in such a way that they fall under the same care as being mounted. And even with that low fertilizer concentration, on the warmer, drier days, I still go around within the hour to spray the media and the roots with plain water again, just in case the balance is off and my roots would burn again. And I say again because I have learned my lesson, over fertilizing and burning roots to the point that I lost some orchids and others were considerably set back. Honestly, when it comes to mounted orchids, less is truly more and less more often balances out any concerns of under-fertilizing. Leaching salts from a mounted orchid is just as important when being cautious about the fertilizer concentration, because salts can build up from tap water or well water if the parts per million of that water is too high. Anything above 200 parts per million for the cleanest water is what I consider too high, because I like to err on the side of caution. Other information out there confirms that the PPM of tap water can be higher and still serve well for watering orchids. However, by putting information like this out there, I prefer to be super safe as to what I say and I will not delve into margins that could cause issues. They don't have to, but they could. But as a preventative measure and so as not to even have the salt buildup manifest itself or if salt buildup is minimal, 
Having a regular flushing schedule in place by simply soaking the mount and the orchid roots in a container full of the cleanest water source you have with the lowest parts per million for an hour is definitely an advantage. If needed, repeat the process the following week. If the orchid is already suffering damage due to salt buildup, you will need to take more drastic steps, which could include the removal of the orchid from its mount, soak the orchid roots in distilled water for an hour, and then remount on a clean mount. So if you're still here, <laughs> thank you so very much. I hope that this was of interest so far. And now I would like to explain my not so aesthetically pleasing to the eye in organic mounts. You see, even though I live in southern Spain, baked cork bark is not easy to source. The raw material, yes, but as mentioned, I prefer not to have something that I need to change in a few years and unbaked cork bark will degrade relatively quickly. If I wanted to grow more orchids mounted on cork bark and I can find a piece like this one, then usually I have to purchase the gaggle of air plants that are attached to that piece of baked cork bark that I want. And well, I have enough air plants because that is how I came to acquire the dendrobium aphyllum cork that it is mounted on. I had to buy it with air plants. <laughs> You'd think here in southern Spain how you could catch a break with getting, you know, my hands on baked cork bark relatively easily. Uh, no. <laughs> Instead, to make it more economically sound, I chose to go inorganic as best and as often as possible because I have to water my mounts a lot for 80% of the year, resulting in my sphagnum moss would degrade much quicker and the algae that came with it as a consequence would not help the situation either. I had to change my sphagnum moss two times per year, which would always mean that one of those times I would be fiddling with the roots during a phase when they're not in active growth, which is always a risk. So enter in organic and no, I could not afford EpiWeb, which then inspired Michael McCarthy to suggest scrubby pads for pots and pans. The plain ones, of course, not the ones that have cleaning products infused or incorporated into them. That idea morphed into me finding extractor fan material that was lighter and more manageable, which took the place of sphagnum moss. So the combination of the more dense padding of the scrubby pad and the fluffy characteristics of the extractor fan material have worked very, very well for fine roots as well as the roots of the Brassavola orchids. I have plenty of residual humidity around each mount. The white filter material retains a lot of water and for the orchids that are a little more prone to rotting roots during the winter, this scrubby pad has proven very, very effective as it dries out much quicker even with cold temperatures. The oldest mount I have with a scrubby pad only is two years old and while I can feel the fibers starting to stiffen up, they're not falling apart. And going back to the principle of not disturbing the orchid at all, I can sew a fresh piece of scrubby pad onto the back as and when needed. Same with the white material. Some mounts are now two years old and I used it as an initial bedding for my Stanhopia acidensis. Since that orchid was placed in the basket and is now creating its own little microclimate, I have ripped away at the white material bit by bit to allow for future spikes to push through without hindrance because despite the fluffy soft nature of the material, it is really tough and even Stanhopia spikes and to some degree new growths find it difficult to pierce through the web of fibers. So it was a learning curve to go completely inorganic, but it was and will continue to be worth my while. I have not lost an orchid to this setup and this combo. On the contrary, my zombie rhizome was one of the first I mounted on a mount like this. I had nothing to lose. The orchid was nothing but a rhizome. And here we are, <laughs> maybe in 2023, it will end up blooming. But yeah, it is definitely not an attractive look. I am happy though that it is working for the orchids that I've mounted this way. Considering that I'm cultivating a film cakeys on a monster mount to hopefully one day have a curtain of blooms, I would not have been able to afford this project if I were using bark with sphagnum moss. Long term, if this mount is going to get to where I want it to, it will also get very, very heavy, so it's filled with the extractor fan filter, and the whole mount cost me no more than 5 euros. And 
three hours of making it. <laughs> Add labor to that. <laughs> However, it is lightweight for now, but that will help in the future. When the cake is mature and grow, that will result that the weight of the whole mount is going to increase. So apart from a mount being the most natural way to grow an orchid in captivity, it is not an ideal setup for many growers. However, mounts can be so versatile in so many ways. Even an orchid on a rock placed on a saucer is a mounted orchid. And I wish I could find myself a nice big rock for the east side corner of my patio and then find a nice sized Dendrobium speciosum that I don't have to wait for 10 years till it grows to size and blooms. I want that to take over that rock and that corner. It would be the icing on the cake for me to have that massive orchid mounted on a rock that would accommodate it for decades featured in that corner. Better than the bougainvillea that is of a giant variety which should never have been planted there in the first place. Picture a dendrobium speciosum. <laughs> but if that thought inspired you and you have the right climate, consider mounting orchids around your garden landscape on rocks. The possibilities are endless and I am back full circle to what I mentioned in the beginning. Al fresco orchid growing all year round. Letting nature do the work, that is the holy grail of growing orchids. And all of you that watch this video growing in such a climate, I envy you a lot. I really hope this video was of interest, not too rambly, and if rambly, hopefully full of information and inspiring food for thought. Once again, if you would please hit that like and share button and subscribe to the channel, know that I appreciate your support just as much as I appreciate you watching the video. And if there was anything that I mentioned that is unclear and you would like me to go into more detail, please point that out in the comments and I'll be happy to continue talking about orchids, <laughs> as always. <laughs> I wish you a fabulous day. On one condition though, please, that you stay safe. <laughs> Take care. Bye.